Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Hello, welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology. I'm sitting in my lawn and there are quite a lot of bits of my lawn that I let grow quite wild and we only mow them at the end of the summer and that allows all kinds of plants to establish in the lawns. Of course we think of lawns as being just consisting of grass as that's mostly what people want a lawn to consist of and some people of course spend a lot of time trying to remove any other plants from their lawn. They wage war against moss, they wage war against daisies and dandelions and they only want to have grass in their lawn. So in a conservation lawn, rather than grass, you want to have lots of other things growing, wildflowers, etc. But actually, what people often find is that it's really difficult to get them to establish. So you can throw in tons of seed of all kinds of different species that you'd like to have and find that nothing ever establishes. And that's because grass is actually a really good competitor. And once you've got a good sward of grass established, other things can find it quite difficult to invade. But there is a plant that if you sow its seeds into your lawn and your lawn isn't too dense and thick, has a pretty good chance of establishing. And it's called hay rattle or yellow rattle. Now the reason that the hay rattle is able to establish in your lawn when lots of other wildflowers might find it difficult is because hay rattle is not an ordinary plant. It's got a special trick up its sleeve and it's what we call a hemiparasite. Now about half the species on this planet, amazingly, are parasites of one sort or another and they are freeloading on the other half. Now hay rattle is a hemiparasite, that means it doesn't rely entirely on parasitism and we can see that it has nice green leaves which do conduct photosynthesis. But it doesn't have very many leaves and they're quite small so it's surprising that it's so successful. But below ground the hay rattle doesn't produce any proper roots. Instead, what it does is it plugs into the roots of grasses and it plugs into their xylem vessels which are conducting water and mineral nutrients and it taps off their water and their mineral nutrients. The effect of adding hay rattle into a piece of grass is that it starts to weaken the grasses and that means that it's easier to get some of the wildflowers that you want to grow in your lawn to actually establish because they struggle to compete against the grasses, especially if you've been fertilising your lawn until fairly recently. Now there are lots of schemes up and down the country where people are trying to restore wildflower meadows. They're trying to turn that area of just grass into a meadow which is filled with lots of different species. And this hay rattle is one way that they can help, that can really help them to do that. So they sow that in with the wildflowers in the hope that it will emerge and start parasitising the grasses and make it easier for other wildflowers to establish. So in this episode we're going to go out to my local park where there are some areas where they're trying to restore meadows and where we can see lots of rhinanthus growing. And later in the programme we're going to hear about some other parasitic plants including mistletoe, which is probably a familiar thing at Christmas at least, and Rob Salguero Gomez who works in the Department of Zoology has a study going on that plant and we're going to find out a little bit about what he's doing. Hello, my name's Chris Thorogood and I'm going to be talking about this um, seemingly unattractive plant, but it's very, very interesting. This is a broom rape. Its scientific name is Orobanchi. And why is it interesting? It's parasitic, so it steals all of its food. It robs its existence from the roots of green plants. And you'll notice that this plant has no green leaves or chlorophyll of its own. It also produces no functional roots either. 
and as a seedling it attaches to the roots of other plants, in this case to the roots of an ivy, um, and then it siphons off its food. Now broadly speaking we can divide parasitic plants into those that are photosynthetic still, the hemiparasites, they have their own leaves and chlorophyll, and those that are not and are completely dependent upon their hosts for their survival, such as this broom rape. Now parasitic plants can have what's been termed the Dracula effect, so they suck the life or the sap out of their host plant like this one. Some of these parasitic plants have shifted from the wild vegetation to cultivated crops, so witch weed is one um, particularly pernicious weed that across Africa and Asia um, can have devastating effects on crops, so it costs about, um, devastates about 10 billion dollars worth of crops every year, so it's a real problem for farmers. Um, so it's, it's worth studying and understanding these plants to understand how to control them where they become weeds, but it's also interesting to understand them um, because they're fascinating in, in their own right. These are evolutionary enigmas um, and little is known about the life history of many of the species. Some of the exotic ones um, are fascinating. One of the better known um, is Rafflesia, which produces the largest flowers in the world. They can grow to over a metre across. And this extraordinary plant is an endophytic hollow parasite. So not only does it not have leaves or chlorophyll like this orobanchi that I've shown you, it also lives inside the tissues of its host, um, only emerging when it produces these gigantic blooms on the rainforest floor. Um, so if ever there was a botanical enigma, um, this is it. So I've left my garden and I'm in the part of Cutterslow Park. And Cutterslow Park is run by the City of Oxford Council. You can probably hear the road in the distance there. It's not that far away from here. Uh, that's the ring road around Oxford, a very busy road. But in this park, if you can ignore that noise, it feels very tranquil. And there's lots of different parts of this park. This park has been allowed to become a really nice meadow. And I don't know what you can hear in this film, but I can see butterflies flying around. I can hear grasshoppers chirping. And it's what we think of as a traditional nice meadow. And that means it has wildflowers in it. And I've got a few different ones to show you. I don't know how well the camera will pick them up, but there's four on my hand here. This little red one here is a red clover. The white one is an oxide daisy. It's much bigger than the lawn daisies that grow in your lawn. Then there are two yellow ones. This slightly more feathery thing is a uh, lady's bed straw. It smells quite nice, the, the foliage, and that's where it gets its name from. And this is um, eggs and bacon. It's um, a little sort of low-growing yellow flower. So all four of these can be found in abundance here and lots of other flowers as well. So that's the question really. Why is it that in a nice meadow like this you've got all these wild flowers and it hasn't just it's not just the grass totally dominating and that's what I want to think about in a bit more detail and how the yellow rattle is playing a crucial role in maintaining these wild flowers. Okay, so what's going on in a meadow? Well, what happened with a lot of our traditional meadows is people started to fertilise them added fertiliser to get more yield, to get more grass. Remember the grass the farmers would harvest and use it to feed their animals. And when artificial fertilisers became available, farmers leapt on those and started fertilising their pastures. Now what happens when you do that is that grass, grass and the wildflowers you can think of as being two different strategies if you like. And it turns out if you don't fertilise them too much and you let animals graze them or you perhaps mow them once a year, then these two things can grow together side by side. But when you start to fertilise, the grass becomes really dominant. And what it's a bit like playing the game rock, paper, scissors. And if you can imagine that the grass starts playing the strategy paper and the wildflowers are stuck with the strategy rock. And as you know, if you play that game, when paper meets rock, paper always wins. So every time these two things meet, the paper beats the rock and gradually the grass just takes over and the poor old wildflowers are wiped out. Now, if you're familiar with that game, you will know that what you need in a game of rock, paper, scissors, for it not just to become as boring as that, is a pair of scissors. And that is what the hay rattle represents. So let's just cut some here and we'll see what happens now. So this is now my hay rattle. This is it when once it's um, setting seed. These are the empty pods and listen. 
that is the rattling and that's why it's called hay rattle. So this is now playing the strategy scissors. And of course, when scissors meet paper, scissors cut paper. So the rhinanthus, the, the hay rattle, attacks the grasses and wins against the grasses. But the flower flowers are still playing rock and scissors doesn't win against rock. In fact, it loses. And that's because this plant cannot parasitize the wildflowers. It can only parasitize the grass. And so now we have all three strategies. We have rock, we have paper, and we have scissors. And the three of them can actually live together very, very well indeed, because nobody has an absolutely winning strategy. And so that's how plants can play rock, paper, scissors. Today, we will learn a bit more about mistletoes. Mistletoes are semi-parasitic plants. A semi-parasitic plant is a plant that obtains some but not all of the necessary resources from another living species, like a tree in the case of many mistletoes. A really interesting feature of mistletoes is the point of connection to its host tree. Here you can see a drawing of a deciduous, because it has currently no leaves, a deciduous host tree, as many you can find across the UK. And then here you can also find an individual of mistletoe. Mistletoes, of course, do have leaves and branches, but if we were to zoom in, what you would see is that in this part, the section where the branch of the host tree and the mistletoe come in contact is lacking roots. What you can find instead of that is a really interesting architecture. If you can zoom in here, you will be able to see it. Point it with my finger, I'm showing you the haustorium. The haustorium is a root-like structure that the mistletoes develop when they first germinate upon the branch of the host tree. This structure allows the mistletoe to become a hemiparasite. Hemi comes from Greek, means half. So it's a half parasite. This structure allows it to steal, quote unquote, water and nutrients from the host tree. Water and nutrients that are, of course, coming all the way from the underground section of the tree. So they steal the water, they steal the nutrients, and they carry out their own photosynthesis. But even then, they're not 100% efficient at doing that. There was a paper that came out last year in Nature pointing out at the fact that the photosynthetic apparatus of mistletoes is not as efficient as many other plants across the tree of life. So perhaps, instead of referring to mistletoes as hemiparasites, we should perhaps call them three-quarter parasites, not hemiparasites. Well, I'm back where I started just to finish off this video. A huge thank you to Chris and to Rob for making those pieces. When I filmed the introduction, I hadn't even asked Chris to do it, hence uh, that was really nice of him. And I don't know whether you noticed, but if you look at that Rafflesia picture that popped up during his little uh, piece, you'll notice it's not a photograph, it's one of his amazing paintings. And Chris is a very, very talented botanical artist, as well as knowing loads about plants. And his Twitter feed has lots of his lovely pictures pictures if you're not already following that. So parasitic plants come in different shapes and forms. We have the hemiparasites, we have the full parasites who really are the vampire plants and the rhinanthus in my lawn. Well I've only got a few plants here. I don't know whether you can see them or whether my cameraman can see them. There's the big dark brown seed pods and they've managed to recover a bit. They didn't like that very very dry period earlier in the year but they are setting seed now and I'm hoping that by having them in my lawn they'll help other wildflowers to establish. I've also got mistletoe actually in my apple tree at the back of the garden and what happened this year we noticed it had completely come unplugged from the tree and has fallen out and I don't know but I think that might be the host tree rejecting the mistletoe. Plants do have a kind of primitive immune system. They are able to recognise when they're being invaded by something that isn't themselves and take action against it. So like all of us in the face of disease and parasites we're not helpless in the face of them. We've got weaponry and we can fight back. Anyway, I hope you enjoy hunting for vampire plants yourselves and see you next time on Back Garden Biology.